has been a, a remark. I think it would be no exaggeration to speak of a reversal of scholarship with respect to the uh, credibility of the Gospels. In this conversation, I'm joined by Professor William Lane Craig. He's visiting scholar of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology and professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University. He's been a professional philosopher and New Testament scholar since the 1970s, writing dozens of books on the existence of God, the resurrection of Jesus, and the overall reasonableness of Christianity as he sees it. For decades, he's publicly debated the most formidable and well-known atheists and critics of Christianity, including Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, and Daniel Dennett. He may very well be the best defender of Christianity in the world today, and his, he was recently named as one of the world's most influential philosophers. He gives insightful and succinct answers to some very important questions, and I think you'll enjoy this conversation greatly. William, thank you so much for joining us. Can I begin by asking you a simple question, but a very complicated one in a way. What is philosophy? And what drew you to it? Yes, a simple question. Um, I like the definition of philosophy given by the great uh, American philosopher Alvin Plantinga. He said that philosophy is simply thinking hard about something. And that seems to me to be correct. Philosophy explores the foundational questions of every discipline at the university. And what attracted me to becoming a philosopher was my becoming a Christian. My junior year in high school, I became a Christian and suddenly found myself committed to certain metaphysical claims, such as the existence of God, the reality of objective moral values, the knowability of truth, the belief in a soul that survives the death of the body. And so at once I was catapulted into thinking about these profound and difficult questions. And so for me, I am a philosopher because I am a Christian. Well, now that's really interesting. Let's explore that for a moment. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Bertrand Russell, in his History of Western Philosophy, was reluctant to concede that Thomas Aquinas could have been a philosopher because he came with a preset uh, set of assumptions. Uh, he was a Christian. Yes. And uh, he, you know, Bertrand Russell said, well, you can't be a philosopher if you're setting out to defend, his, his words rather than mine, uh, to defend and understand Christianity. According to him... It shouldn't be anything other than the dispassionate quest for understanding without any settled commitments, especially religious. How would you respond to that? Because clearly you're very openly and boldly coming in at the other end. Yes. Well, the irony is that Russell's conception of philosophy was actually the same as Aquinas's. Aquinas also made this division between theology and philosophy and thought that philosophy per should be pursued only on the basis of reason and not on the basis of, uh, for example, divine revelation. So actually, Aquinas was very much in agreement with Russell on what a philosopher is and does. This view of philosophy, however, is today quite outmoded. There's no reason at all to think that a philosopher should not avail himself of all of the sources of knowledge that he believes are uh, at his disposal, whether these be the sciences, uh, metaphysics, rational intuition and logic, or divine revelation. And so on the contemporary scene, it's widely acknowledged that you can come at your philosophical questions from a point of view. You simply need to acknowledge what that point of view is, give arguments in support of it, and be prepared to interact with those who disagree with your point of view. But today, the view of philosophy that seems to be the consensus view might be called dialogical pluralism. Namely, you have a plurality of viewpoints from which you come at subjects, and then you dialogue honestly uh, with your uh, conversation partners about these. It's, um, 
My impression is now that there is a, a new openness to faith in uh, philosophical circles, but probably mm -hmm. to the average person on the street, there's a perception that universities in particular, uh, their philosophical schools and academics are fiercely opposed to religion. Is that a false misunderstanding? Yes, it I mean, is would be those a false who are. misunderstanding. And, and I appreciate, John, your perceptiveness in seeing the revolution that has been going on in the field of Anglo-American philosophy since the late 1960s. Um, since that time, Christian philosophers have been coming out of the closet and defending uh, their beliefs with sophisticated philosophical arguments in the finest philosophical journals, in the professional societies, and in the top academic presses. So that today, um, Christian philosophy has a respected minority status, a place at the table in contemporary discussions. I think, unfortunately, this has yet to filter down to the man in the street from the ivory tower. And so he still has that misimpression of philosophy that was accurate, say, from 1900 to about 1970, um, in which philosophy was dominated by atheistic and scientistic um, viewpoints. But that's quite uh, out of fashion today. That's interesting because, uh, you know, when you listen to the hubbub on the streets, a lot of it centers on how, just how uh, anti our culture, religion, mm. uh, the Enlightenment, uh, even science and reason and all of the great ideologies, things like critical theory are in our universities. So you've got this contrast. You, you, you've got a discipline yes. where there's some very clear thinking, very honest thinking going on, and you've got, I'm going to be really blunt here, the intellectually very flimsy concepts that are coming out of a lot of uh, left-wing campuses. Yes. Yeah, I think you're right, John, in saying that what we're seeing is an increasing polarization. I would not at all want to deny the presence of these anti-Christian and secular movements within philosophy, but I am saying that at the same time, there is a resurgence, a renaissance of theistic and particularly Christian philosophy in our day, and, the, and these viewpoints find themselves locked in a titanic intellectual struggle that is going on in our Western culture. And then, of course, uh, if we can come to God and science, the one that's, mm. you know, the, the, the bull in the china shop, so to speak, uh, you and I believe in God, uh, but we both have friends and relations and so forth, uh, many people in our wider circles who do not believe in God. And they're often rational and reasonable and likable people that we're very fond of, and yet we find that we have a profoundly different perspective. Can you give us a feel for why you, or what you mean by God, and why you think it's more rational to believe than not to believe? I think that minimally, God can be defined as a transcendent creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute goodness. And I would say that contemporary physics when compared to the physics of a generation ago, is more open to the existence of a transcendent creator and designer of the universe than at any time in recent memory. In the scientific as well as philosophical literature, you find discussions of the beginning of the universe and uh, the possibility of a transcendent personal creator uh, and fine tuner of the universe who sets the fundamental constants and quantities uh, of nature that are so inexplicable on an atheistic perspective. So I do believe that uh, accompanying this renaissance in Christian philosophy, there is following in its train a similar openness in the hard sciences toward the uh, theistic views of the world. That's interesting because, again, the person in the street would say uh, you can't be intellectually consistent and at the same time be both a scientist. Or they would say that many scientists say you can't be intellectually 
consistent at the same time a scientist and a Christian. That's certainly been the sort of Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris or the impression yeah, they left with the community. And, of course, one of the things that they do is tend to say, well, you know, if there's not a consensus among scientists, it's close to a consensus. It's overwhelming. Oh, well, now that's actually sociologically false. I've seen sociological surveys conducted among scientists comparing the percentage of scientists today who believe in God compared to, say, back uh, around 1910, 1920. And really, it's roughly the same. It's not as though there's been this vast increase uh, of atheism among professional sciences. That's just sociologically false. But I can think of very uh, many prominent physicists today who are outspoken theists, people like Christopher Isham, who's perhaps Great Britain's uh, premier Christian cosmolo uh, premier uh, quantum cosmologist, uh, or Donald Page, a uh, collaborator with Stephen Hawking, or uh, South Africa's George Ellis, who probably knows more about contemporary cosmology than anybody else alive. Um, there are some of the most prominent uh, physicists today who are uh, theists and are quite open about it. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting that that is so often missed. It perhaps is, uh, uh, as, as Peter Hitchens puts it in the end, it's a choice we make. Mm -hmm. uh, to some extent. And uh, if, if you're hostile, then you'll find reasons not to. If you're not, yes. then you'll find you'll go looking for the evidence and conclude, perhaps as you and I have, that it's more rational to believe than not to believe. But we, we leave out that element of choice, don't we? Because Yes, you're, you're quite right. No one is claiming that the evidence for God is coercive, uh, that you cannot resist it. Of course you can. And it does depend, I think, upon these issues of one's openness to the divine, uh, whether or not you'll follow the evidence where it leads. So coming through, before we come back, uh, and I'm very keen to switch to the positive in a few moments in terms of your faith and, and Christ and the Bible, um, evil and suffering is the other big one. It's probably the biggest uh, uh, faith blocker of all, although... Perhaps in our modern world, it's uh, more and more a case of, uh, well, I just don't like, I just don't like it, so I won't uh, leave. That's this is the age of, I guess, psychological man. If it doesn't feel right, then it can't be right. There are no absolutes, but nonetheless, evil and suffering is a big one, and I'd be interested in your perspectives on that. You, you hear people say that, particularly, uh, the Abrahamic God, who's all powerful and all knowing. Uh, and all good, and you've just made a reference to uh, to that yourself, the locus of all good things. Yes. Um, now, there's the atheistic argument from evil, and it basically runs that if there is such a God, and I, look, I don't want to sound unsympathetic about this, it's a big challenge. Evil is a big problem. Uh, just as I described uh, exists then, uh, there, there'd be no evil or, or suffering, but there is a lot of evil and suffering uh, in the world, therefore... Uh, there can't be a god, or certainly not a Christian god. Mm -hmm. So where do you, where do you, where do philosophers in general come out on that question of suffering, and where do you, where do you land? Well, historically, for centuries, uh, atheistic philosophers have defended the view that the existence of the suffering and evil in the world is logically incompatible with the existence of God. And now on the contemporary scene, this has really changed. Virtually no one defends the logical version of the problem of evil anymore. And the reason is that it lays upon the shoulders of the atheist a burden of proof that is so heavy that no one has been able to sustain it. The atheist would have to prove that there is no logically possible reason that God could have for permitting the evil and suffering in the world. And no one can prove such a thing. Mm. So those who do defend the problem of evil today have retreated from the logical version of the problem to the so-called probabilistic version of the problem, where the claim is that given the evil and suffering in the world, it's improbable that God exists, if not impossible. 
And the difficulty with this version of the problem is that it makes probability judgments that are simply beyond our ability. There is no basis for thinking that if God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil and suffering in the world, that these should be evident to me. For example, um, every event that occurs in human history sends a ripple effect through history such that God's morally sufficient reasons for permitting it might not emerge until centuries from now, perhaps in another country. Uh, an illustration of this would be the so-called butterfly effect in contemporary physics. It's been shown that the fluttering of a butterfly's wings on a twig in West Africa can set in motion forces that will eventually produce a hurricane over the Atlantic Ocean. And yet no one watching that little butterfly on the branch could possibly predict such an outcome. These kinds of probability judgments are just beyond our capacity. And similarly, when we see some instance of suffering and evil in the world, we are simply not in a position to say with any sort of confidence, God probably doesn't have a morally sufficient reason for permitting that to occur. A second point that needs to be made here is that when one's talking about probabilities, then you've also got to consider on the other side of the scale, what is the probability that God does exist? And here I would offer uh, multiple considerations that I think make it quite probable that there is in fact a transcendent creator and designer of the universe, despite any improbability that the suffering in the world might throw upon the existence of God. Interestingly, uh, I've never forgotten the story, a, a true story, about a young university student uh, in Scotland, not long after, well, probably, uh, I suspect during the depression years, things were grim. And he knocked on the door, uh, it was open, of a small cottage, it was opened, uh, there was a returned serviceman from the First World War. And when he realized the young man wanted to talk to him about God, he said, go away. He said, uh, hmm. I was in the trenches in France and I stopped believing in God when I saw all that evil. And the young man uh, said to him, I respect that that must have been terrible. Uh, and I certainly won't test you. But can I just make the observation that I wonder if I'd been there, I might not have stopped believing in man rather than stop believing uh -huh. in God. Yeah. And the old man looked at him, tears welled up in the, his eyes, and he said, you better come in. We need to talk wow. about this. Yeah. It's an interesting take on evil. I, I sometimes think that one of our problems is that we're not self-reflective enough. Yes, I, and and certainly one of the major developments in philosophy with respect to this problem is the so-called free will defense, in which... Um, Philosophers, I think, have been able to show that it's neither improbable nor impossible um, that every world that God would create that would involve this much good, this much moral goodness, would also involve this much moral evil freely perpetrated by human free agents. So that ultimately, the the blame lies at man's threshold and not at God's. All right. Well, let's let's move on then to the thing that I know that you you speak so eloquently about, which is Christianity, and more particularly its founder, because of course the Christian story is yes, suffering is very real, very mm. real indeed. Uh, but uh, you know, God does care, uh, and does offer a way out of it. That's essentially the message. But let, let's pad that out and explore that a bit. Uh, can you um, give us a feel for who you see Jesus as having been uh, and what made him different from any number of other religious leaders of his time and throughout history? I think there is something of a consensus among New Testament scholars today that what made Jesus different is that he came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, with the authority to stand and speak in God's place on matters belonging properly only to God. And that's why he was eventually condemned by the Jewish Sanhedrin for blasphemy, 
and then delivered for execution over to the Romans uh, on the charge of treason. And so it is these uh, allegedly blasphemous personal claims whereby Jesus arrogated to himself prerogatives belonging only to God that sets him apart from other religious teachers and figures. And of course, it was immensely divisive. And you get New Testament warnings about party spirit. Uh, we might say in Australia today, the mob going mad. American founders were worried about the mob going mad. You see this sort of fickle human nature playing out in great divisiveness. So at one moment, he's welcomed into Jerusalem and the yeah. palm fronds are laid out and he's a hero. The next, he's on a cross after the most unjust trial you could imagine and the cruelest execution mankind's ever been able to devise. It really does contrast uh, our ability to think reasonably and what happens when a sort of mob rule mentality takes over, doesn't it? What, can you throw any light on, on the way we behave that way? Sometimes so wildly irrational. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, one moment in love and the next moment violently, violently evil towards another human being. In the case of the Passover crowds in Jerusalem, when you look at the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey uh, in fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy, they thought that this was the coming Messiah. They thought that this was the man who would throw off Israel's enemies, and that meant Rome, and reestablish the throne of David in Jerusalem, where he would be ruling over all Jews and Gentiles alike. And during Passover week, then, Jesus, I think, proved to be a, a profound disappointment to these crowds who were expecting him to uh, overthrow Rome and to establish David's throne. Instead, um, when Jesus was asked about paying to taxes to Caesar, he gave a very anti-revolutionary uh, response. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And so you see how that crowd was so fickle and turned against him under the instigation of the uh, Jewish um, chief priests and the temple authorities, so that now they began to cry out for his crucifixion and death. And you still see today, particularly in these troubled times, uh, or you still hear, calls for a new messiah. What we need is a benevolent dictator. Mm. You hear it all the time. There's still this search for someone who can lead us out. And surely one of the great lessons is that there's no human being who can. There are great leaders, a Churchill, a Roosevelt, uh, but uh, they're not able to, if you like, introduce nirvana and peace on earth. It doesn't happen. Right. And Jesus said the kingdom that he came to bring was not an earthly kingdom, but it was a spiritual kingdom um, of which everyone who is his disciple is a member uh, and follow him as, as our Lord. But it is not one that is established by force and, and violence and political means. Now, you speak uh, as though um, the New Testament has great authority. Uh, many would say, look, it can't be relied on. Uh, much of it was written years after the events. It's not a historical record uh, that mm -hmm. can, be, can be trusted, uh, uh, particularly in relation to the teachings of this man, Jesus. That's if they don't, if they give up arguing that he didn't even exist. Most people do concede that he did. You plainly believe that... Um, those records are real, that they're reliable, uh, historically uh, they stand up? Well, here again, John, interestingly enough, a similar revolution to the one I described in philosophy and in physics has taken place in New Testament studies. The skepticism of the 19th century and early 20th century about the reliability of the Gospels was rooted in the fact that scholars interpreted them against the backdrop of pagan mythology. And so they thought of these narratives as overlain with layers of myth uh, and legend. But what has happened in the second half of the 20th century and now on into the 21st is what has been aptly called the Jewish 
reclamation of Jesus. Scholars have come to appreciate that Greco-pagan mythology is just the wrong interpretive background for Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was a Jew, and all the disciples were Jew. And the proper interpretive context for understanding Jesus of Nazareth is first century Palestinian Judaism. And when the Gospels are read against that backdrop, they emerge as very credible sources for the life and teachings of this man. And so there has been a remark, I think it would be no exaggeration to speak of a reversal of scholarship with respect to the uh, credibility of the Gospels. Back in the 1940s, Rudolf Bultmann, a prominent New Testament critic, said that the historical information about Jesus of Nazareth could probably be written entirely on a four by six index card. Today, however, the Gospels are widely regarded as belonging to the genre of ancient biography, and as such, are very credible sources for the life of Jesus of Nazareth. We have four biographies of Jesus, which is almost unprecedented for major figures of the ancient world. And so there has been quite a... Um, a reversal of scholarship with respect to the historical Jesus and the credibility of the sources for him. Well, that, that, that brings us to the very interesting point, of course. In the end, uh, the most extraordinary claim of all is surely the yes. resurrection. I mean, the idea that God would personally intervene and come to earth is up there, but the resurrection is unbelievable. Or is it believable? <laughs> and I suspect that everything hinges on whether that event really happened. Yes. And lawyers have poured over it for years, and many have come to the conclusion that their witnesses, the eyewitnesses, were entirely credible, and they couldn't have invented it. But anyway, I don't want to preempt. I'm just really interested in the, and your argument for the resurrection, because if it's real, it changes absolutely everything. If it's not real, as, as the Apostle Paul put it, more to be pitied are Christian believers. Yes. My doctoral work at the University of Munich was on this question, and I was quite taken aback, quite surprised to discover that the central facts undergirding the inference to the resurrection of Jesus are actually acknowledged by the wide majority of New Testament critics today, be they Christian or non-Christian, liberal or conservative. And these facts can be summarized under three main headings. Number one would be that um, the tomb of Jesus uh, in which he was buried was found empty on the first day of the week after his crucifixion by a group of his female followers. The second fact is that thereafter, different individuals and groups of people came to experience appearances of Jesus alive after his death, following the, this his crucifixion. And then the third fact would be that the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead despite every predisposition to the contrary. Now, those three facts are not simply the possession of conservative scholars. Those are the widely acknowledged um, facts uh, about the fate of Jesus of Nazareth held by historical Jesus scholars. So the only question is, how do you best explain those three facts? And I'm persuaded that the best explanation of them is the one that the original disciples themselves gave, namely that God raised Jesus from the dead. And this is so significant because if that is the best explanation, that means that God has publicly and dramatically vindicated those allegedly blasphemous claims for which Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, and that therefore he in fact was who he claimed to be.
That's very interesting. Um, in this country, in Australia, which is seen as extremely secular, mm-hmm. uh, not perhaps of the level of a France or, or some of the Scandinavian countries, but nonetheless up there, uh, it, it is amazing that the research suggests that a minimum, the lowest figure I've seen in any credible research, 35% of Australians still believe the resurrection happened. The high number is around 43%. And yet it doesn't follow through. If if you if you believe it happened, what is it? You might be able to show some, throw some light on that. What is it about our mindset, our culture, that says you can take the view that something as profound as that happened, but you don't need to do anything about it. You just mosey on with your life. Well, frankly, John... I just don't understand that mentality. I cannot understand it. It it seems to me that if this actually occurred, that means that this man was who he claimed to be, the Son of God and the absolute revelation of God the Father to mankind, Uh, and that therefore we need to listen to what he said and what he taught. Uh, And that means that Jesus holds the key that unlocks the door to eternal life, that it is through him that we can find forgiveness of our sins, moral cleansing, and reconciliation with God, and come into an eternal love relationship with the creator and designer of the universe. So this is huge. You you cannot understand this and be apathetic about it. It It should change everything. Yeah, that's that's my point. It it, it absolutely mystifies me. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, 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 and it mystifies me in the sense that not only do I think it's important, I, I just I look around and I see how miserable Western society has become, and mm. how limited and inward looking it is, and how we've cheated our children. I can't can't get over the raw data on their levels of anxiety and depression and self harm. Yes, and yet we have no narrative. And we're not prepared to, all we want to do, all our elites simply want to mock the one narrative that seems to have provided a a durable and lasting meaning purpose in people's lives. But um, perhaps we're just talking to one another here in agreeing. (laughs) Well, I've emphasized this in my work. Uh, As someone who comes out of a non-Christian background, I felt deeply the darkness and the despair of a life without God. And when I became a Christian uh, that junior year in high school, the most profound difference that it made for me was not the joy or the love that it brought. It was the meaning. meaning. It gave meaning to my existence uh, and that life now was not simply doomed to end in death and extinction, but my life was infused with an eternal significance. And so for me, that turned my life upside down. Uh, I became a disciple of Jesus and have followed him ardently ever since. Can I come to your recent work, In Quest of the Historical Adam? Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, in that, you address a particular element of that that broader objection that we spoke of earlier uh, to, to God. Uh, and it's and the Bible, the the question of Adam and Eve, and how the early chapters of Genesis can be seen alongside scientific observations and theories about the origins of humanity. Can you give us a feel for for your views here, and address how you consider the science alongside the Bible, which you believe is ultimately God's word yes. here? This was a question with which I wrestled mightily, and the conclusions to which I came involve two uh, claims. The first one is that Genesis chapter 1 to 11, which include the stories of Adam and Eve, belong to a literary genre or type um, that need not be interpreted literalistically. We're familiar with other types of literature of this sort. For example, the Psalms are poetry which will often use figurative or metaphorical language to describe God. Or the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, is Jewish apocalyptic literature, which is filled with symbolism uh, and should not be read in a literalistic way. And my contention that I argue in considerable detail 
is that Genesis 1 to 11 also belongs to a type of literature that is uh, concerned with historical events, but which should not be read in a literalistic way. It, too, is written in the colorful uh, and figurative language um, that uh, shouldn't be taken at just face value. Now, if that is correct, that means then that we can turn to modern science to ask us about the question of human origins as to when human beings came into existence on this planet. And as a result of my study, I am absolutely convinced that Neanderthals were fully human, uh, and that therefore, if there was an Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve had to be prior to the divergence of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. And that would place them at the time of a, a human species called Homo heidelbergensis, or Heidelberg man, who was uh, a human uh, being that had a brain capacity uh, comparable to modern Homo sapiens, uh, a modern uh, appearance, um, and yet who lived around 750,000 years ago. And so I, my proposal is that we identify Adam and Eve with two members of this species, Homo heidelbergensis, who were then the progenitors of subsequent uh, human species so that every human being is descended from this primordial uh, foundational pair. And I would note that that is fully consistent with the evidence of population genetics uh, and uh, paleoanthropology. And so that's the position I defend in the book. And I take it that the other part of it is that what the, the, the beginnings of, of the Bible really, when you stop and think about it, there's very little time spent on the creation issue that troubles so many people. It moves mm -hmm. much faster to explain the human condition the, the, the problem yes. of evil, the problem of rebellion, the problem of selfishness. Yeah. Uh, old fashioned people called it sin. It's perhaps best defined as selfishness. I want to do it my way uh, and uh, I'll be God over my life. Uh, and since I'm God, don't you interfere with me uh, when you're talking to your neighbour as well. Isn't that the, really the thrust? Uh, Yes, I, I think that in particular, the first chapter of Genesis, the point of the first chapter of Genesis is not to say that the world was created in six consecutive 24-hour days. Rather, it uses the metaphorical language of days to desacralize nature. In contrast to the ancient myths of Israel's neighbors, Genesis 1 does not regard the natural world as infused with gods. Uh, rather, God is a transcendent creator of the universe, and the things in the natural world are just ordinary things that God has made and therefore are not to be worshipped or venerated as deities. And this desacralization of nature, which is normally attributed to the Ionian uh, Greek philosophers, the pre-Socratics, I think actually takes place in Israel centuries earlier, uh, and it represents the religious genius of these ancient Hebrews that they understood the transcendence of God over the created order and the naturalness of the created order, and hence its... Um, um, susceptibility to human exploration and discovery. It's a charter, in effect, for the project of modern science. Talking of modern scientists, Dawkins, of course, looking at the old, well, he looks at the New Testament and says the story of the death of Christ is about, is, is a cosmic child abuser. But he, referring to the Old Testament, he says that, um, you know, God has to be a moral monster. He orders mm -hmm. genocide and punishments for crimes like adultery that no modern enlightened person would consider just. It's a, it's a challenge, isn't it? Um, yes. He, he paints the God of the Old Testament as immoral, and that resonates yeah. with a lot of people, particularly young people. They bought that idea. How, how would you counter that 
version? Well, this is a huge question that needs to be dealt with on a case-by-case basis. And I would recommend a book by my friend Paul Copan, C-O-P-A-N, called Is God a Moral Monster? And Paul goes through these various allegations and I think shows again and again that these um, assertions are unfounded. If I might just take one example, God's command to Israel to uh, drive the Canaanites out of the land when he delivered the land over to Israel was not a command to commit genocide, as people like Dawkins and others have claimed. There was no command issued that they were to chase down and exterminate all of these people. Rather, these nations were to be destroyed as political entities, as nation states. They were being divested of the land, and the land was being given over to Israel. And so if these Canaanite clans that had been inhabiting the land had simply left in the face of the advancing Israeli armies, nobody needed to die at all. There was no genocidal command. Uh, They were rather being driven out of the land and divested of the land. And anybody that was killed was killed simply because they remained behind to fight and resist the Israeli armies that were coming in. Well, then to to sort of start to pull all of this together, by way of conclusion, can I ask a a couple of questions? What do you say about the existence of other religions? Why why are you so Mm -hmm. sure that, that, that Christ is truly God and the right way, as he himself claimed, in no uncertain and very black and white terms. We know that even amongst um, uh, members of Bible-believing churches now, there's a view that, uh, you know, there are many ways to heaven, so to speak. Well, I do think that theological pluralism is the burning issue uh, in our day, And here I would recur to what I said about the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' resurrection from the dead sets him apart from anybody else in authenticating those allegedly blasphemous claims for which he was crucified and shows that he was indeed who he claimed to be. And so my conviction that Christian theism, as opposed to, say, Islamic theism is true, would be rooted in Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Again, it comes back to that question of the resurrection. Did it happen or did it not happen? There right. is no other more extraordinary challenge to our thinking that I, that I can even begin to contemplate. Uh, many would say, look, people gravitate towards Christianity because they need a crutch. They need a father figure. They need to feel loved. Yes. So in other words, it's not based on thinking things through. It's about emotional factors, the comfort, uh, the the sustaining, uh, the warmth. What are the implications that you think? uh, uh, We are emotional beings, we're intellectual beings. How do we balance that out? In an age when, frankly, we rely more on feelings, we confuse feelings for thinking often. Yes, I I think that's undoubtedly true. And that for many, many people, that's quite right that they come to place their faith in Christ Um, for spiritual or emotional uh, reasons and not on the basis of a a decision about the evidence. But I mean, in all candor, John, what is sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. And I would say exactly the same thing about our secular and atheistic friends. I, I find that most of them, when challenged, are utterly incapable of defending their views or offering any sort of good arguments in favor of an atheistic or naturalistic view of the world. I find that for most atheists, uh, their disbelief is really rooted in emotions, uh, often in emotional scars and hurts that they have sustained in the context, perhaps, of a a church or a family that was religious uh, and and which left them uh, bitter and and angry. Um, So, this is, this is a wash as far as I'm concerned. Whatever psychological reasons there might be for becoming a Christian or an atheist, the bottom line is which view has 
the better support of the evidence. And here, as you know, I have been uh, willing to debate any of the top proponents of atheistic or agnostic or non-Christian uh, viewpoints on university campuses uh, and defend the superior rationality of the Christian worldview. Mm. Well, I think, you know, it's been a fascinating discussion. I, you know, your, your knowledge uh, and, and your vitality uh, really jump out. <laughs> so what I'd love to do is to just pose this question for listeners who might think that's interesting. I'd like to know more. What would you say to people who are, in fact, curious about Jesus Christ now? Uh, and uh, where would the best place for them be, to be to start now? We, we know in this country anyway, very few people now uh, have any direct connection with a church uh, or, or even with um, people who believe. It's quite surprising how few people have any real mm. contact. Yeah. Um, you go to a wedding now and no one knows the hymns at all, whereas culturally once they did. In our highly visual culture, I find that people are much more apt to look at a video than they are to read a book. So although I could recommend many different books to read, let me recommend instead that folks go to our website, reasonablefaith.org, and there they can view or download, free of charge, uh, a series of animated videos on the existence of God, the problem of evil, the person of Christ, his resurrection from the dead, uh, the exclusivity of salvation through Christ. In fact, uh, John, it's these are videos on all of the questions that you and I have talked about today. Each of these is only about five to six minutes long. They're very entertaining and engaging, and yet they are philosophically substantive as well. So I would encourage people to go to reasonablefaith.org and to spend some time watching these uh, short animated vi animated videos uh, on the credibility of a Christian world and life view. Well, what better note to thank to finish on? Thank you so very much. Uh, as I said a moment ago, it's been very stimulating, uh, very lively, uh, and you're very engaging. So I can only oh. thank you sincerely. Well, thank you, John. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Mm -hmm.